All right, so this isn't news, but did you know that the federal government has apparently millions of pounds of cheese being stored in Missouri? I beg your pardon? Yeah, I'm not going to go into it because that's not the point of this podcast, but look up Missouri cheese caves when you get the chance. It'll change your life. Anyway. <laughs> On a scale of one to millions of copies of E.T. being buried in the desert, how absolutely ridiculous is this? <laughs> I'd say pretty close to the millions of copies of E.T., or at least, was it millions? I think it was thousands. It, I think it was millions. There was I, a I remember... large number of E.T. copies buried in the desert. And a lot of collectors got excited for all of, like, like 30 seconds because of that. Because, like, my E.T.'s were some never mind. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it, it, anyways. Welcome to Under the Bridge, everybody. I'm Cody, <laughs> a.k.a. the Scarlet Troll. And I am Greg, a.k.a. Greg. Or Bob, depending on your time of week. Yeah. And we're pressing on. We are pressing, press on regardless, which was also the name of a race in the 80s. Was it? There was an unofficial event in the World Rally Championship called the Press On Regardless Rally, and it was the only, air quotes, World Rally Championship event that took place in North America. But it didn't count for anything, so, like, two teams would show up. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, learn something new every day. <laughs> So, because I'm not Nick, I have not mm. gathered a ton of gaming news, nor have I gathered things releasing this week or things that came out historically this week, but I do have some gaming news, and we're going to start with that this go-around. Mm. First bit is an excuse to clown on Blizzard. Yay, always the best thing to clown on. Yeah. So what happened was, in a recent Overwatch Contenders tournament, a bracket final which is one round before Grand Final, was listed as being a best of seven, despite most of the matches being a best of five. Mm -hmm. So, one of the Munich players, because it was between 0-1 Esports and Munich Esports, reached out to a Blizzard tournament administrator and received confirmation and reassurance that the winner's final match was best of seven. Munich mm -hmm. started with a 3-0 lead, and then 0-1 managed to claw back up to a 3-2, and then Blizzard Rep stepped in and said it was a best of five. I... What? No. No. No, no that's not okay. <laughs> that is not but, okay at all. Zero One, along with X Oblivion, or Oblivion, I'm sorry for not knowing how to pronounce eSports stuff, I usually don't care. <laughs> who were their opponents in the loser's bracket, actually just turned up for their match, sat down, and then did not play against each other. They just played the game. Just Oh. Yeah. That's that that is a good way to rebel. Yep. I imagine it's one of those things where it's like kind of a contractual obligation of like, well, you just said that we had to be here for the tournament. You never said anything about us actually playing against each other. <laughs> well, a Blizzard rep did threaten to disqualify both teams for refusing to play, but after fans went on social media and, you know, pointed out what a stupid cluster fudge this was, yes. Blizzard allowed the rest of the match to continue later. I, I want to say good, but it's stupid that that happened to be good with. Yeah. It, it's, it truly is baffling. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're going to be do something that stupid, then yeah, you kind of deserve to get your ass called out for it. Especially if you're basically changing the rules like halfway through a competitive tournament. It's like, you're inviting um discourse, negative discourse, and you've kind of forfeited the right to be upset about it. Yeah. How, yeah. how bad do you have to mess up to not know how many rounds you allow in your matches? Uh, yes, is apparently the answer to that. Yeah, you're right. Ask a silly yeah. question, I suppose. Yeah, that is that is just dumb. That is mind-bogglingly stupid. Ugh. Moving on from that, though. Mm-hmm. We got some PlayStation Plus news. Oh, boy. Which is that the Yakuza series is coming to PlayStation Plus in 2022. You may remember Yakuza as being that series that makes Sega money that isn't Sonic the Hedgehog or Atlas. <laughs> I mean, it's, this isn't really related to the whole PlayStation Plus thing, but I forget which Yakuza game it is, but it's the one where it's like a turn-based RPG, and it's completely batshit. Huh. My coworker is showing, like, footage of it at work, and I'm like, what is going on? This is a Yakuza game. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Is it canon? Uh, kind of. <laughs> I kind of want to play it now. <laughs> well, it is the main games that are coming to... Oh, okay. 
PlayStation Plus. We do know that this month, August, we're getting Yakuza Like a Dragon, okay. Yakuza 0, Yakuza Kiwami, and Yakuza Kiwami 2. All four of them are going to be for PlayStation Plus Extra and PlayStation Plus Premium. Yakuza Like a Dragon will also be on PlayStation Plus Essential. Mm -hmm. Then later this year, we are getting Yakuza 3 Remastered, Yakuza 4 Remastered, Yakuza 5 Remastered, and Yakuza 6 The Song of Life, all for PlayStation Plus Premium, with Yakuza 6 also being on PlayStation Plus Extra. I would say that's not a bad deal overall. I hope that if they're going to continue things like this, they are going to start announcing more and making more of these partnerships pretty quickly. Because one of the big things when this whole PlayStation Premium Plus malarkey was announced is that the games that were included with it were pretty lackluster, especially the lack of like first-party titles. Now, I know that Yakuza isn't, but this is kind of the way to, to kind of air quotes fix that. If Sony does a lot more of these partnerships, especially for like big, long-standing IPs. So more more the merrier, because I could see that like attracting more people to get into that ecosystem. You know the worst part? I actually just upgraded to whatever the mid-tier was just a week ago. Oh, really? And the whole reason I did it is so I could get Marvel's Avengers for free without having to pay <laughs> anybody for it. I mean, technically you're giving Sony more money. But... Yeah, but it's better than giving the developers money. Fair. Although I guess they're probably making money from Sony. Well, that's a, that's a Square game, right? Yeah, technically. Ah, uh, they're probably more. They probably care more about their NFTs. So, what can you do? Yeah, they sold the people who made this game. Oh, never mind then. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this was made by one of the divisions that Square sold. Okay. For NFT money. I mean, fair enough. I I still have zero sympathy for anything Square Enix right now for that very reason, and I and I'm not even a fan of them. <laughs> like, I don't play their games. Yeah. I've only started playing Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> So you said you had a follow-up to the Yakuza news? Yes, because, you know, you take the Yakuza series and you think, oh, you know, this series is great, but it could use a crossover with another well-known game. I wonder what that could be. Well, Is Ubisoft... it Senra and Kagura? No, it's a something from Ubisoft. They have come beckoning that call and Maybe have rabbits? included... No, they have announced a Yakuza-themed elite skin package for Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. Nani? Yes, because it's like a thing of like, you know what you need to include in your game where you have like special ops and police officers like fighting against terrorists? Have a skin where you're playing as a gang member. <laughs> I mean, you know. It's... It... it's... <laughs> so... I didn't even find this out naturally. I found this out from my coworker because he was checking Twitter really quick when um, when we didn't have anybody at the store, and I just hear him very loudly go, "What the fuck?" And I look over at his phone, and I just see it on Twitter, and I just start belting out laughing. So apparently, what it is is that for the operator known as Echo, who I believe is like actually a Japanese anti-terrorist police like officer that's in the game, fictional character, obviously. They're going to introduce a skin for her that turns her into Kiru? Kairu? I, I, Kiryu? Kiryu. Cool. I suck at pronunciations, and I'm also not at all familiar with the lore of Yakuza, so for all I know, this woman could actually be a police officer within the Yakuza lore. Yeah, I don't know either. But it's still... Oh no, Echo's a guy, never mind. Hey, maybe Point I can still play stands. some of the series now that I have PlayStation Plus. <laughs> Point still stands. On one hand... I definitely cannot say that this is the nuttiest IP versus video game crossover that's happened in the past year, but it's definitely up there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the title of that is still taken by the Attack on Titan Call of Duty Vanguard crossover. Cool, cool. <laughs> and they said Smash Brothers Ultimate was the most ambitious crossover in gaming history. Yeah. Move over, Sakurai. There's a new <laughs> golden boy in town. It, and his name golden... is Yakuza X Tom Clancy. And a bunch of and a bunch of French developers. <laughs> oh boy. Mm. I thank you for this. You're quite welcome. Like I said, when I saw this, I'm like, you I was like I was basically said the same thing about you. I was like, Nani the fuck? <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. Mm. Let's bring down the mood a little bit. Indeed. 
Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic's remake has been indefinitely delayed, allegedly. Yeah. Not only that, apparently they fired both the art director and the design director. Oh, that's great news. That yep. that in, that attracts confidence. Ugh. Good old Metroid Prime 4 syndrome. Mm, wait, did something similar like this happen? Oh, Metroid Prime 4 changed developers mid-cycle. Did they now? I didn't know that. Like, like, like Total Studios? I think, yeah, I think originally... Ugh, now I don't remember. I feel like originally it was Bamco who was working on it, and then they switched to Retro, I think. Okay. Let me double check this real quick. You're good. I was going to say, as far as the whole Kodor thing, I'm kind of in a mixed bag, because I'm still a little bit salty about the initial announcement about it being PlayStation exclusive. So, who knows, maybe with any luck, this will be one of the things that will come from this is an actual, like, cross platform thing i doubt that'll happen because that's a lot more legal stuff than development stuff but it still kind of sucks because i know a lot of people have been looking forward to this so for it to basically be delayed with like no indicate or allegedly delayed at least with no indication of when things will pick back up i do feel for a lot of these star wars fans one of which being a very good friend of mine who kind of shared my reaction where it's like they're remaking kodor but it's playstation exclusive those bastards <laughs> <laughs> That was yeah. basically our conversation when we talked about that. <laughs> yeah, it is Retro Studios who's developing it now. Nintendo never confirmed that Bamco was working on it, but mm. it was reported by Eurogamer that Bandai Namco of Japan and Singapore was developing it. And then in 2019, it was announced that development had restarted under Retro Studios because development under the previous studio had not met Nintendo's standards. Which... What is Ooh, that boy. even? I was like, Nintendo standards. Like, what is that even? I feel like, granted, you're much more f familiar with Nintendo's history than I am, but I feel like saying, like, this doesn't meet Nintendo standards is kind of the same thing of it. And this is kind of getting into the nerd stuff that I get into of, like, people who say it's like, this operation was executed with military grade precision, and people in the military <laughs> are like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I think it could mean a number of things. Nintendo does tend to hold a pretty high standard to their first-party IPs. Okay. Alternatively, it could be the direction that was being taken with the game did not line up with their expectation, because Nintendo does tend to value their first parties and try to make sure that their first-party IPs are well-developed, but they can also be kind of strict and stringent with what form that takes. Okay. So, not being up to their standards could really mean any number of things. Yeah, I mean, I will say I am glad, in a sense, that Nintendo does, like, give a full shit, in, as regards to half a shit, I guess, in regards to their first-party title, so that's good. Um, I don't know. Like, I just hope, if nothing else, it just doesn't, like, kind of affect everything else for them going forward. But this is Nintendo we're talking about, so... <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that's enough dithering about about Metroid Prime 4. Mm -hmm. I've got one more bit of game news that I found out today, which is... Mm. And this is something only I'm going to care about, and even I only halfway care. Right. We got Pokemon news. Really? Yes. Okay. We got competitive Pokemon news. What? <laughs> Um, sure? <laughs> At the start of September, Series 13 of the Pokemon VGC will allow mythical Pokemon to compete, and are also lifting restrictions on legendary Pokemon. So I have no, like, knowledge of competitive Pokemon. To be completely honest, and I know how stupid this sounds in hindsight, I didn't even know that there was a s significant competitive Pokemon crowd to begin with, as, in oh, terms yeah, there of is. the games, that is. So is it, like, one of those things where it's like they're allowing, like, OP as hell Pokemon to take part? Is that well, kind of the idea? Mythicals, I don't really know how... It's hard to gauge how OP Mythicals are because they haven't been allowed to compete, but... Mm. <laughs> Fair. Generally, I think the main reason Mythicals weren't allowed to compete is that the distinguishing feature of Mythical Pokemon is that they cannot generally be encountered in normal gameplay. For the okay. longest time, they were only available either through special in-game events that were distributed or by getting codes and accessing them through mystery gift. So I believe the reason why they weren't originally allowed was because it felt like gating potential progress behind 
things that weren't allowed, or things that not everybody had access to. Okay. But recently, starting with Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, they've been making mythical Pokemon more readily available. Deoxys has been catchable since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. You can now get Mew and, I think, Jirachi in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, if, as long as you have save data from specific games. You can mm. now get Darkrai, Shaman, and Arceus in Pokemon Legends Arceus. Although, uh, I do want to specify, some of these Pokemon technically aren't allowed in, because all the Pokemon that can compete are the ones that are available in Sword and Shield, which aren't all the Pokemon anymore. Thanks, Game Freak. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But this does open up some interesting possibilities, because Mythicals have decent stats all around, and they tend to have some interesting move sets. For example, Mew can learn pretty much any move. Like any move that any Pokemon can do. Just about. At the very least, it can learn any TMs or any TRs, which are items that let you do so. I think there are some things that it can't get. Okay. I'm pretty sure anything that's super exclusive, like Draco Meteor, it can't learn because it's not technically a dragon type. Mm. Mew's also interesting because it has Transform, which lets it turn into the opponent. Oh, so it doesn't turn into a clapped out Chevrolet Camaro? Yeah. <laughs> Victini ought to be crazy too because it has some very interesting moves and abilities. Okay. But it is cool to know that Mythicals are now allowed in, and it sounds like they're also allowing any legendaries that are in the game to compete where previously those were restricted. The only real clause is you can only use one of each species, so you could bring a whole team of six mythicals. And that would be zany. That does not sound fun to fight against. Granted, again, my knowledge of Pokemon overall is, well, relatively limited. And by relatively limited, it's all the Pokemon games are expensive, and that's all I care about. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to... I might actually try to keep track of this upcoming series, because this, I think, has some potential for wacky hijinks. And I do love me some wacky hijinks. That is completely fair. Wacky hijinks are always a good time. That it is. So I think I've butchered Pokemon news enough with my total lack of understanding of the VGC. For sure. <laughs> Let's get into movie stuff, or other stuff, non-game mm -hmm. stuff, because I think there's also some TV stuff in here, too, that I mm -hmm. found. And let's start with another little sad bit of news. There will not be a Tomb Raider sequel. Wait. I thought there was another Tomb Raider thing being made. MGM no longer has the rights. Really? Yep. Huh, I wonder what happened there. Uh, apparently, I think the rights might have run out or something. Oh, okay. Huh, okay. I mean, I never saw the newer Tomb Raider movie, or movies, uh, parentheses S, but I'm surprised because I could have sworn I heard not that long ago that they were, like, making headway on getting the next movie started, but, huh. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for all the people who are, like, starting to work on that project, at least. Yeah, and unfortunate for Alicia Vikander, who will be recast and will not be reprising the role. Uh, uh big sad. Yeah, it stinks, because I, I don't remember much of the Tomb Raider movie that I saw mm -hmm. four years ago, I think. But <laughs> I remember I didn't hate it. I think it was pretty okay, which, as video game movies go, is actually pretty fucking spectacular. Yeah, like, thinking it's like, this is our right, is might as well be nominating a video game movie for the for the fucking Emmys or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's undergone a bit of a change since we've gotten stuff like Detective Pikachu and the Sonic movies, but... True. But it's still far and few between that we get really good ones. Case in point, Mortal Kombat. Case in point, upcoming Gran Turismo movie. Case in point, probably the Mario movie. I do not expect that movie to be good, and I am just ready for it. I am so eager to see that train wreck. <laughs> so we'll see who gets the rights, because apparently people are in the middle of a bidding battle for it. Eh, understandable. Yep. But also, I was kind of curious to see where they were going to go with another one, potentially. Yeah. You know what? I do remember one other dumb thing, which is that they saved the bit of her getting her guns for the very end. Really? They did. I remember that. That's I remember that stupid. Was like, that was either the end of the movie or it was a post credit scene. That's... that's dumb. Yeah, it was. Ugh, okay. Let's move on. Yes. Apparently Ben Affleck is gonna be in Aquaman too. I take it as as Batman? 
Yep. Okay. I don't... Granted, I... Wait, but I thought that movie was finished. Uh, I... Uh? I, I thought that... Wait, I feel... Why would you wait so long to announce well, that? Well, the idea, I think... Because remember, this was supposed to come out after The Flash, originally. Right. And now it's coming out before. <laughs> True. So what I've heard is that originally Batman's cameo was supposed to be Michael Keaton. Because Ooh. Michael Keaton will presumably be the Batman in the new post-Flash, Barry fucking up the timeline <laughs> world. Okay. However... What I've heard is that, and I haven't had a chance to substantiate this part, so this is all scuttlebutt. Right. But, I say heard like I know anybody, but it's actually just what I've gleaned from, you know, reading the internet, mm. is focus audiences were confused by Keaton being Batman, because Flash hadn't come out yet to explain it, so they switched to <laughs> Affleck because people will recognize that and understand that. Uh, I mean, that does make sense. So, yeah, I, I, I can see I can see the decision making process there. Although that does, you gotta that does wonder if he's how much is he in the movie? I assume he's not in the movie that much or else it wouldn't be worth it to reshoot with. Act I mean, like you just have to cut him out entirely. But if he's barely in the movie, then who cares if they're confused? If anything, that's a hey, watch the flash to see how this happens. And God knows yeah. you need all the reasons you can get to convince people to see the flash. Yeah, for real. Yeah, I forget the feeling that whatever, you know, obviously don't know for certain, but I get the feeling with stuff like that. The first thing my brain goes like, all right, and this cameo is just going to be like, like kind of shoehorned in. Like, it's not really going to be put in with any real elegance. So we'll we'll see. That's just my like what I'm expecting at this point. Yeah, we'll we'll see how clumsy it is. I'm expecting mm. Barry. I am also expecting Barry. In other DC news, we have confirmation that the Flash TV show is ending with Season 9, which has been given a slightly reduced episode order of 13 episodes. Okay. I can't believe- God almighty, that show's still going? It is the longest running of the CW's Arrowverse TV shows. Okay. Even I mean... Arrow only got eight. Ha! <laughs> I mean, you know what? Power to them. If they've like been able to keep things going, that usually is a good sign. So, hey, power to all the writers and all the people involved. I just thought that series ended ages ago because I never hear anything about it. I Especially after the one event that happened that caused the Flash subreddit to turn into the Marvel's Defender subreddit. Oh, no, wait. That was the, the Arrow subreddit turned into the Daredevil subreddit. After, oh. I think it was after... <sighs> I think Barry and Iris got married, and then Felicity, at their reception or something, or was it, there was a proposal during a wedding, and it was very gauche, and it was the straw that broke the camel's back, and everybody got very upset about it. Okay. I think that's what did it. Hmm. I mean, fair. All right, Anyways, I mean, hey. I stopped watching The Flash partway through season two. Who knows, mm -hmm. maybe I'll catch up now that there's an end in sight. Insert catching up joke here because the Flash. Uh, no, I do not have the energy to try and think of a joke for that right now. <laughs> this does mean the only DC shows left on the CW are Superman and Lois, Star Girl, and upcoming Gotham Knights. Mm. You have no idea how mad that show makes me. <laughs> Just on I principle. Just on principle. I mean, fair fair and valid. <laughs> the mere fact mm. that they, ugh, they they gave Batman a brand new kid. Batman has enough fucking children. Which is hilarious considering how lonely of, of a motherfucker he is. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> it's like, you're in a constant state of depression. Here's a child. Cheer like, the what? fuck up! <laughs> It's like, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to... No. <laughs> I'm going no, to teach no. him... Yeah, we're not talking Batfleck. We did that. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to teach this orphan, like, how to, like, subdue people with, like, blunt force trauma that doesn't actually kill them. And everyone's going, or you could do that, too. <laughs> you know what? I take that back. Keaton, Keaton Batman also killed. So... Fair. You know, <laughs> not a fair comparison. 
Right, right. Hell, technically, I think even Nolan Batman's killed some people. <laughs> I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you, so you're killing him. Yeah, Good it's like, this is some, like, 5D, like, trying to, like, make yourself guilt-free chess going on right now. <laughs> I don't know why, but I have the image of Batman fighting crime, but he's got a baby Robin strapped to his chest in one of those <laughs> baby harnesses. <laughs> So, even though I do not keep up with the comics, so basically Jubilee right now with the kid that she adopted. Oh yeah, that did happen. Did she adopt? I thought that was just her kid. No, I think she. I think she more or less adopted him. I think it was a thing of. I only noticed from reading the Marvel subreddit and just stumbling on Jubilee's page. I'm like, since when did Jubilee have a child? Oh, yep, adopted. Neat. I think it was a thing of like the kid was going to be like sacrifice or something and jubilee was just like oh hell no <laughs> you know the crazy thing i have the first volume of the Krakoa era excalibur run where he's a pretty major player and i forgot all about him <laughs> i need to catch back up on collecting those the the Krakoa mm. run of x-men is pretty damn good okay <laughs> anyways flash it's ending kind of sad i hear people saying they should get grant gustin to play the flash in the movies and it's like why would First of all, everybody who watched the show is going to be like, we've seen all this before, because after nine seasons, they have to have done everything. Yeah. And second of all, especially, Flash fucking up the time stream was like season three, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. <laughs> been there, done that. Got the t-shirt. <laughs> second of all, I, I gotta imagine he wants a break from this shit. I mean, I sure as hell would. I, I'm pro I'm pretty sure he's like a thing. Like I've done this for nine seasons. I've got all the money I could want. I'm I'm gonna take a break, guys. <laughs> right? Because he deserves it. Yeah, a hundred percent. Unless he wants to keep going, in which case, more power to him. He can't possibly yeah. be a worse pick. Yeah, for sure. He's definitely better than Ezra Miller from what I've seen in the show, and that was before the whole everything. I, I... <laughs> I was going to say, given current events, that is not a particularly high bar. <laughs> I'm just I'm just glancing to the side warily <laughs> while my non-existent <laughs> producer just stares at me, making the, uh, uh, don't do it motion. Mm. <laughs> uh, all things in due time, though. All things oh, yes. in due time. Mm. I've also got some minor Marvel news updates based on some of the stuff we learned at San Diego Comic-Con. Okay. We have some clarification on Spider-Man freshman year, and apparently it's a glorified what-if. Uh, I don't like the sound of that. Yeah, per producer Brad Winderbaum. Well, like we said in the panel, it follows the pattern that you see in Civil War. Down to Peter getting the broken Blu-ray player from the trash, and he walks into his apartment for the famous moment where Tony Stark is waiting for him to offer the Stark internship and take him to Berlin. But because of things that happen in the multiverse, because of new random occurrences, it's not mm. Tony Stark who's waiting for him there, it's Norman Osborn, and that sends his life in an unexpected trajectory that collides him with many unexpected characters in the Marvel Universe. I don't like the sound of that. No! I, I'm far less interested. Yeah, it's like, I would think that you, I should be excited for that, because it's like, oh yeah, multiverse, opens new possibilities, but I feel like, I, I kind of feel like that's a thing where... They went, oh, multiverse, let's just whip something up, rather than something a bit more organic to me. Like, I, I don't know. That, Why that does him running great. into Norman Osborn instead of Tony Stark lead to Nico Minoru and Amadeus Cho existing? I don't know who those people are, but I'm going to agree with that statement. <laughs> uh, I forget, you ever see any of the Runaways? No, I have not. Okay, so Nico Minoru is a spellcaster. She has a staff of one, which can do just about anything, but it can only do it once. Mm-hmm. And Amadeus Cho is the seventh or eighth smartest person on planet Earth, maybe like ninth or tenth now, I don't know. Or maybe he's not even that high up. on The point is, he's super smart, hung out with the Hulk for a bit, hung out with Hercules for a bit. I think he still has the ability to turn into a Hulk himself. He was a totally awesome Hulk for a while post-Secret Wars, and now he's going by the name Brawn. It's pretty alright. Uh, okay, that's that's a lot. He's an arrogant sort. I like him. I mean, given the company he keeps and his abilities, I would be surprised if he wasn't an arrogant sort. Yeah. But no, honestly, I feel on this feels less interesting. I liked it better, or I liked the concept better, 
when I thought this was going to be a genuine prequel to Spider-Man Homecoming and Civil War, and we were going to get a lower-key Spider-Man of him figuring out the ins and outs of this stuff. Maybe he fights the chameleon, maybe, like, Hammerhead or Tombstone or something like that. But mm -hmm. once you throw in stuff like Doc Ock and, and Scorpion and Rhino and what have you, it's like, okay, this is cool, and gosh knows we could use a Spider -Man sh another Spider-Man show, especially one where he's not just associating with all the Spider characters and that's it. Yeah. But, on the flip side... You don't need all the MCU trappings. If you're going to diverge, diverge. Yeah. And if you're not going to diverge, don't just make it a one-off one what if episode because who yeah, cares? Yeah. I kind of feel like you know, while I have the utmost respect and of course and massively enjoy like the MCU and everything it's created, anything it can, everything it continues to create, I feel like Except what's happening Except Love and Thunder. Except for Love and Thunder. <laughs> Uh, got him! <laughs> Fucking got I, him! I, I feel like what's happening, and this is kind of the thing I kind of feared for a while, <clears throat> is that anything that's new that comes up that's not directly tied with the movies, it's going to be one of those things where whoever's writing it or writing it or whatever is like, well, we still have to pull a bunch of stuff from the movie side of things because that's the only way we're going to keep people like interested. And it's like, no, you you really don't have to do that. Just yeah, especially it... now that you're all under one umbrella. Now is not the time to... Just because you're under one umbrella doesn't mean it all has to fit the MCU aesthetic. Branch yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, like, come up with new things. If it works, it works. Great. If it doesn't, well, it's Marvel. They have shit tons of money. I think a couple failures here and there isn't actually going to hurt them. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I mean, I'm still probably going to at least check out the first bits of it and see where it goes, because this might still be interesting. But right. it's just kind of disappointing and also yeah. uh, i guess this means no uncle ben still and uncle ben continues his tradition of being the only like marvel character that stays fucking dead <laughs> well it's not even sorry that he it's not even that he's staying dead it's that i understand not including uncle ben or the origin in homecoming or in civil war mm -hmm. because we've seen it it was still relatively recent at that point because Amazing Spider-Man was only, what, 2012? So it yeah. was still very fresh in everybody's minds. But at this point, it feels like Ben might as well not have existed at all. Yeah. And I feel like it's still important that he does. And we did get a reference in Far From Home, I think, because his suitcase has the initials BFP or BRP. I... BP yeah. is there for Ben Parker. And also he gets directly name dropped in the zombies episode of What If, but that's MCU mm -hmm. adjacent and judging by some of these what ifs, I don't think some of them could be one hundred percent branched off the MCU timeline anyway. But point is at least a direct reference in a Marvel adjacent thing would be nice. Yeah. Speaking of other stuff that may or may not be canon. Mm -hmm. It sounds like I Am Groot might actually be canon after all. How? Well, uh, according to, again, Brad Winderbaum, it takes place between the end of Guardians 2 and before the tag scene in Guardians 2. So it's post-Guardians 2, pre-teen Groot. It okay. might be that James Gunn was just clowning when he said it was Earth Pie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Because <laughs> initially, what I thought when he said it wasn't necessarily canon to the Guardian saga was mm -hmm. that he just meant it wasn't essential viewing like the holiday special apparently is, which I... Can I just say I cannot believe that? What an absolute madman. <laughs> Making that a is, holiday special that is, required viewing. That is a, a like massive confidence right there, it's, it has to be said. Right? I cannot mm. wait. Is it December yet? No? God damn it. But We're getting there. We are getting there. Yeah. My assumption when it first got out was that he just meant, this isn't important. But then when he said it was on Earth Pi in response to somebody asking where it was if it's not part of the MCU, I assumed that meant, okay, maybe it actually isn't canon, but it now sounds like either either Marvel doesn't know, or... 
he was just clowning. And <laughs> it could be either or. James Gunn is a funny mm. guy. James Gunn is a funny guy. I mean, we've seen... I've seen all of Peacemaker, and you've seen part of Peacemaker. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh... Like, I mean, I, I just saw, time. like, su- the, I mean, I just saw the Suicide Squad. It's one of those things. It's like, oh, this man is actually pretty twisted. I freaking love it. <laughs> yeah, no, that was good. Yeah. Oh, boy. And then, in the last bit of Marvel updating, we have confirmation from Kevin Feige via The Hollywood Reporter that Fantastic Four will not be an origin story. Neutral? Like, honestly? I'm fine with I, it. Yeah, like, not bad news, but not great news either. I don't know. I guess it's just because it's like, okay, like, that's good, I guess, but we don't even really have a lot to work with on the movie to begin with, so it kind of doesn't mean much of anything right now. Well, I think that's good because it means you can focus on their dynamics because you don't have to give a bunch of time to how they get their powers. Because, in his own words, he comp- he compared it directly to bringing Spider-Man into the MCU, saying, a lot of people know this origin story, a lot of people know the basics. How do we take that and bring something that they've never seen before? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. for me, that's exciting because that means we don't have to spend time setting up the whole going up in a space cosmic rays situation. And even better, this means hopefully they'll avoid the mistake the other Fantastic Four movies that were theatrically released made, <laughs> which is tying Doom into their origin story. Because that is a terrible fucking idea. For a movie. Yeah, yeah, because I'm not overall familiar with everything that is Doctor Doom, but it is kind of one of those things where for how much and how just major a character he is within that section of Marvel, I don't think you can really... There's no way you have enough time in a movie, even if it's like a three-hour movie, to introduce both Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom and fully establish them as characters. Like, that's that's pretty much impossible. Yeah, Doom needs to come either independently of the Fantastic Four, or one or the other needs to be developed first. Yeah. Like, you do a Fantastic Four movie, you bring Doom in in the sequel, potentially, and then have that movie be more about Doom, because you already know how the Fantastic Four operate, or you introduce Doom somewhere completely separately, Mm -hmm. and just allude to his enmity with the Fantastic Four until they finally clash somewhere else. Either yeah. one is fine. Honestly, I kind of prefer the idea of him popping up somewhere else because as much as Doom is Reed Richards' arch enemy and also the Fantastic Four's arch enemy kind of as a whole, right? the great thing about Doom as a villain is he also functions pretty much as an arch enemy for the Marvel Universe as a whole. You could have Doom pop up basically anywhere and not only does it make sense theoretically, but he can hold his own, or he can lose, and it'll just be a Doom bot. I'm imagining Doctor Doom popping up in a couple specific places, either like anything to do with Ghost Rider Hell Charger, anything with that, or the whole thing where Peter, um, I think he's, I don't remember if he like sold his soul or whatever to like kind of right all the wrongs and got rid of his marriage. It's like, but I'm imagining like Peter Parker getting ready to make that journey, and Doom just appears. It's like, wait, bitch. <laughs> 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 no, I'll tell you where Doom should pop up. Mm. Should pop up at a Heroes for Hire series so they can do the bit where he stiffs Luke Cage at a $200. <laughs> you really want that to happen, don't I you? want it so bad. It's so <laughs> funny. It's so funny because it's so petty and dumb. Mm. Doom just hires him to track down some robots and then skips town so he, who I remind you is ruler of an entire country, does not have to pay $200. And then Could've... Luke Cage... Goes into the Baxter building, fights the Fantastic Four, convinces Mr. Fantastic to loan him a rocket car, goes to mm. Latveria, helps out a resistance, saves Doctor Doom's life because he didn't sign up to help murder the guy, and then when Doom tries to thank him and offers to hire him as a bodyguard, he's like, man, I still want the 200 you owe me, and Doom's like, you did this whole thing just for that, and then he reaches into his wallet, pulls out $200 US, <laughs> gives it to Cage, and then says, get out of here, man. <laughs> it's the craziest shit. I was going to make the, jo- the joke of, like, Doom is being short because I guess the Latvian currency is, like, hitting rock bottom right now. <laughs> I, uh... yeah. Anyways, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to a Fantastic Four movie that is not an origin story. 
He mm. also dropped a little bit of a thing about Deadpool 3. Okay. And noted that historically Marvel Studios tends to go big for part threes and ask the question, how do we elevate it in the way we've been able to with Civil War and Infinity War and Ragnarok? It's very fun to be in the world of the Ryan Reynolds show. <laughs> so that suggests okay. they're aiming high for Deadpool 3. I don't know okay. what you could possibly do with Deadpool to make it mind-shattering, but... I do like that they have just referred to the movie at this point as the Ryan Reynolds show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's face it, Deadpool would not be nearly as Deadpool without him. Was it you that mentioned, like, an article where someone was, like, interviewing someone who, like, wasn't, like, part of Deadpool but knew Ryan Reynolds and someone asked, what's he like? It's like, have you seen the Deadpool movies? It's like, yeah, he's like that all the time. That is that is him. <laughs> I don't remember, but it mm. might have been me. <laughs> so that wraps up the news that I've got and also the random tangents based on that news that I have mm. got. So I think it's trailer time. It's trailer time. What do you want to start with? I mean, so there's a couple different things that weren't initially on the list that I'm interested in. One of yeah. which being, as I am blinking, blinking on the freaking name of it because Devotion. I was really excited. Thank you. Devotion. Yeah. That the is very much. The plane adventures of Kang and Hangman. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that when we saw the trailer, like, I was... He was watching the trailer, and then goes, it's it's Kang. And it's like, yeah, it's Kang and the asshole from Maverick. <laughs> I hate that this is how my brain recognizes people. No, I mean, it's completely fine, and it's totally understandable, because that's how people recognize a lot of people. Like, one of the captain, one of the other, like, side characters that shows up for, like, a split second of that trailer is like, oh, you're Don from the newsroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, cool, I'm glad you're still doing things. This is very much a movie up my particular alley. Right. Even be even being a history nerd, the Korean War is very much one of my weakest subjects, and and to be fair, Korean War is really something that doesn't get a lot of like attention, which is very very strange. But yeah, it looks really cool. We got drama, we've got sacrifice, we've got a bunch of like plane foo, we've got fight like actual jet fighters versus propeller plane foo, uh, <laughs> which is like. As I thought about it, I was like, wait, this did happen during this war. That is actually the most terrifying shit imaginable. When you're like, <laughs> yeah, it's like you're in like, what was the top fighter plane at the Pacific Theater? And the Russia's like, yeah, we got jets. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, shit. I don't know a lot about the story of this movie. I know that it's based on actual events. Like the two leads um, are actually representing two actual pilots, um, two actual like Marine Corps pilots during the war. So it is like one of those like act like what's being shown is more or less biographical. All right, but yeah, it looks cool. I'm just into it just because of how unexpected it dropped, and it's like, wait, a Korean War of like fighter plane movie? All right, sign me the hell up. <laughs> yeah, this definitely looks interesting. I'm not a super huge fan of historical based films in general, mm -hmm. but I do like the cast for sure. Oh yeah, the cast looks solid on its own. And it certainly doesn't look bad. Not necessarily oh, yeah. my cup of tea, but certainly not bad. And oh, like you said, it seems like Korean War movies do not really happen all that much, so that adds an interesting wrinkle to the thing. Yeah. There's a few elements where the fact that it's historically based does make me feel a little bit better about it, because otherwise there's things like Buzz in the Boat where I'm like, this feels... I don't want to say like Top Gun, but it feels like exactly the kind of thing I didn't like about the first Top Gun. I saw that, and I did think to myself, okay, there's them trying to attract the Top Gun crowd, like, when that scene happened. Cool. It's like, was it just that, me? Sweet. Yeah. No, that that was my first thought. I was like, oh, there it is. <laughs> Funny enough, that's a thing, that's an actual stunt that I don't like. It's like, nope, that's just, that's sympathy points lost for me. Mm-hmm. Why you do this? Why you do this? But I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I'm 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 definitely very curious about it. It will probably be because like I said, it's very much up my alley. Something I will probably see in theaters. Um another oh, thing that I it's oh, November. Go ahead. It is November oh shoot, it is November. November twenty third. Alright, let's go. Let's go <laughs> And I guess kind of the other thing that was shown that I'm interested in 
is the we got the trailer or at least the actual like full trailer i guess i don't know for star wars andor and ladies and gentlemen of all the things that you could possibly want in star wars i am pleased to announce that we have ak 47s in star wars (laughs) were they being carried by jeans guy (laughs) it is such a minor thing so the thing is like this is this is just like a completely like minor tangent like all things considered but it's something that I can't ignore. Star Wars has historically used like actual weapons as props and put like a bunch of like Star Wars stuff on it. Like Han Solo's blaster is a World War One era Mau- Mauser pistol. Um, the I think like the D eleven or B eleven is literally a modified Sten gun from World War Two. Okay, this is like not new by any means. But the thing is, is that they at least try to do more to, like, make it look like a Star Wars blaster futuristic. And, and, and I see this, like, no, this is straight up an AK-47. <laughs> There's, like, no mod. This is an AK-47 with a folded stock. There is no modification to this whatsoever, and I personally find that hilarious. Like, the magazine is different, but that's it. And I personally find that extremely funny. <laughs> All right. Otherwise, this is very much one of those Star Wars things where, even though I did like... What's the dude's name? Cassian? Cassian Andor? Andor what? Uh, God damn it. <laughs> um, even though I very much like the main character, this is very much one of those Star Wars things for me where for all things that are being shown, I kind of don't care about the main cast. I am much, 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 much more interested in all the background political stuff like that is the reason that I really like the Clone Wars show and why I enjoy the prequel trilogy. Because, especially in the prequel trilogy, I could not give a shit about most of the main characters, but all, like, the background political happenings and the corruption and the creation of the Republic into the Empire. Like, I... Like, stuff like that is just much more interesting to me. So, so this this definitely gives a lot of, like, political thriller vibes, and I am very much there for it. I get you. I mean, Rogue One was... Probably one of my favorite Star Wars movies. Mm-hmm. I don't know, though. I I feel like I've just been kind of burned between Boba Fett and Obi-Wan, neither of which were bad, just neither yeah. of them were really all that great in the end. Like, they, they had good elements, Obi-Wan more than Boba Fett, yeah. but I don't know. I just feel kind of like we're hitting Star Wars saturation. Yeah, I feel like with this, um, since the characters being covered here are relatively minor characters compared to the likes of Obi-Wan or Boba Fett, I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot more rooms for some originality and creativity. Mind you, I still have not watched any bit of Obi-Wan. Yes, I know I'm bad at this. But when this was announced, when they showed the first trailer, I was like, oh, it's Obi-Wan. I'm kind of looking after the Skywalkers. Oh boy, I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> um, with this, it's like, okay, I feel like I I am very much open to being proven wrong. But I feel like that there's hopefully going to be some more kind of like um, liberties taken with establishing the seeds of the rebellion. Because it is kind of a thing of like, you know, you can put together why the rebellion got started because they were living under a literal fascist empire, but it is still really cool to get kind of the more details about all the things that really got that going. Yeah, that's fair. I'll probably check it out, or at least start to check it out when it comes out. Mm-hmm. At the very least, I might watch episode one. I'm yeah. just kind of at that point where I'm burned out on Star Wars because, I don't know, Star Wars feels samey to me in a way that Marvel doesn't. And I only draw that Mm -hmm. comparison because they're both Disney-owned properties that are kind of everywhere nowadays, and I Mm -hmm. can't explain what the difference is. But I feel like there's a difference. I feel like what's happened, granted, again, have not seen a single second of either Obi-Wan or Boba Fett. Again, yes, I know I'm bad at this. But I feel like what's kind of happened, if I absolutely had to take a guess at something, is that I wouldn't be surprised if the higher-ups are banking off of um, Mando and just all, like, the good press and fanfare that got, especially during the last bits of the final episode, which was just, like, 
I am not a hardcore Star Wars fan, but just the last bit of the last episode was just just pure like ah oh, mwah chef's kiss type <laughs> shit. Like like honestly, <laughs> like it's been like with the I guess w- the show's been out long enough. I'm allowed to like actually talk about what happened at the end of it, right? <laughs> at Mando, yeah, yeah. With the whole thing of Luke Skywalker showing up and just everything about how that was set up, even his X-wing showing up to the ship, it was just. It's been a long time since I felt anything in any IP that just, like, kind of grabbed me and made me both, like, curious, terrified, <laughs> and, like, hopeful at the same time. Mm. But I think what's happened is that they're kind of banking off a lot of that. And it's like, well, we have these known characters like Boba Fett and Obi-Wan. People will be here for that. And it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you're completely correct, but you have to make something a bit more compelling. Like, like you said, and this goes with everything I've seen about the shows, they're not bad by any means. Like objectively, they're not bad, but they don't have the same pull and pull. And from what I've gathered quality that Mando had. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if part of the burnout is just from that. That makes sense. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, we've had, we're having good stuff, but we need something that isn't Mando, but still on that same level, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it might also be, now that I think more on it, a lack of clear direction in where it's going, which yeah. was also mm-hmm. kind of a Marvel problem, but you could tell that they were setting stuff up in Marvel. It was just a thing of not knowing exactly what it was, and they were setting up multiple different corners at once. Star Wars just feels like it's kind of wheel spinning until they figure out what they want to do with the movies, which they might yeah. never do. Yeah, I don't, oof. that is kind of something I've been curious about. I mean, there's been a couple of things that have been talked about. Like, we know that there's a Taika Waititi movie, and I guess there's a movie, although from what I understand, it's currently in development hell, like a fighter pilot, Star Rogue Wars Squadron, movie. Rogue Squadron, yeah. Yeah, Rogue Squadron. It's not in development things. hell, it just got delayed so Patty Jenkins could make Cleopatra. Oh, okay, never mind then. Apparently, Taika said his Star Wars movie hasn't even been fully approved yet so that Uh, might not happen okay yeah it's kind of a thing of like i wouldn't be surprised if both for how it was received and what was covered people who like are in charge of the movie department are going okay rise of skywalker does anyone have any idea where the fuck we go from here (laughs) i doubt it yeah it's because it's one of those like i i would not be one of the people who has to deal with that because it's like yeah Talk about, like, climbing up Mount Everest. Oh, boy. Mm. Shall we move on to Oppenheimer? Another one that's very up my alley, even though, again, the Manhattan Project and all of its terrifying goodness is something that I'm not intimately familiar with. But the tone of the trailer, and and we've also, some stills have been shown, like, online of, like, some of the photos, like, during filming. I am very much looking forward to this. You know, it, it looks it looks cool. It was just like a one minute teaser, but just the way they set it up, it is one of those things where especially where they gave like the timestamp at the end, it's like, yeah, no, this is that is a completely apt description, or at least hint, at what's going to be covered given the subject matter of this trailer. I am very much looking forward to this. Yeah, plus the cast is amazing. They got Killian Murphy, Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., yeah. Florence Pugh, Rami Malik. Dane DeHaan, yeah. Alden I- mm-hmm. I- Ehrenreich, David Krumholtz, Kenneth Branagh, David Daskomakian, I- Gary Oldman's in it, apparently. Whoa! Really? Holy <laughs> shit. Josh yeah, that's... Peck! Really? Josh Peck! Wow, Nolan just, like, called up everyone. It's like, I need every motherfucker who has been in a movie or some noteworthy thing. Josh Peck. You know how you were in that shitty, like, um, red alert thing? It's like, yeah, you're in fucking Oppenheimer. I am, also, yeah, apparently, just deal with it. His role is apparently confirmed. I looked it up. He's playing Kenneth Bainbridge, who I had to look up. Fortunately, he also has a Wikipedia article. Uh, <laughs> apparently, he's an American physicist who did work on cyclotron research, director of the Manhattan Project's Trinity nuclear test, which took place July 16th, 1945. Bainbridge described the Trinity explosion as a foul and awesome display. He remarked to mm. J. Robert Oppenheimer immediately after the test, Now we are all sons of bitches. Oh yeah, he did say that. That is one of my favorites. And this that man's is gonna of... be played by Josh Peck. 
Yeah, that that is one of my favorite historical quotes because it is such it is an apt description. Uh, I feel like that is the most apt reaction to we just built something that can wipe out entire countries in in a second. It's like we like what the fuck. <laughs> All right, you know, I wasn't 100% sold on this movie because it's A, historical drama, and B, it's Nolan, who Mm. I'm a little soured on after Tenet, especially because I listened to this trailer with headphones on, (laughs) and I don't understand what it is about this man and his sound design. I don't get it. I feel like I kind of get what he's trying to convey if the sound design is going to be, like, similar, but this is one of those movies where it's like, no, like, like, please don't do that. Considering, like, what's going to be covered in this movie, and especially how goddamn important, for all the wrong reasons, the Manhattan Project, well, for a lot of wrong reasons, not all the wrong reasons, the Manhattan Project was, like, you can't do that, because that's going to just distract from the whole thing. Unless it's done just, like, really, really well. Like, I don't know, maybe they have, like, a scene of, like, either Hiroshima or Nagasaki being bombed. That would be, like, a good scene to you to have, like, Nolan-esque audio mixing. But I just don't do it through the whole movie, please. <laughs> yeah, I just felt my ears rumbling at one point in the trailer, and I just went, oh, God. Yes. Here we are. Anyways, it, I'm mm. still, I'm probably going to check this out now just for the cast. Yeah. But no, we got to wait until next year. Yeah, I saw it was July 23. It's like, no, that's too far away. It'll be a nice cap off to next Metrocon, though. True. But yeah, this looks looks good. And it'll definitely reinvigorate everyone's favorite online discussion. Was the bombing of Japan justified? (laughs) Oh, boy. Let's get off of that. Let's uh, let's say bullet train down. <sighs> I don't know why I put this on the list because it's not even it's not only not theatrical, it's an asylum mockbuster, so I don't know. I just thought it was funny. I figured you put this on here to remind me the, of the time of how the first time that we saw a movie of all of our group together for the first time was me recommending um, White House oh, Down. That was bad. And it's the thing of, like, is there, like, some subliminal, like, message, like, of me recommending that movie and being, like, just everything that came afterwards? <laughs> God, it looks dumb. It looks fucking dumb. Or it doesn't even look dumb. It just looks... I know, like, I understand that it's a a mockumentary, and this is very clear what we're going for. It's the whole, like, this is stupid and the movie's aware of it. So, but I, I, I don't know. I... I I don't personally have any interest in seeing it. Was it White House uh, Down? I thought it was Olympus Has Fallen. It was Olympus Has Fallen. Never mind. Oh, um, that just that bodes super well for that movie, huh? Yes, White House Down. If you've never seen it, is better, but it is a bit like saying syphilis is better than gonorrhea. That is <laughs> true, but I would say so. I okay. would say White House I'm Down not was a, a better. I'm not movie. a medic, so. Oh, I mean, I don't know either. I've and just I've never heard that had either of them, times. so... Yeah, I've never had them either, but I've just heard that phrase a million times. No, like, um, White House Down is a, is better and honestly enjoyable, but still not a particularly high bar, so... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have no strong opinions of it one way or another. Fair enough. Other than probably not going to watch it. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely not. I just think it's really funny how dedicated they are to every time a big budget movie comes out. Coming up with some vague offshoot, slapping a similar title on it, and just putting it out there. Mm. It's terrible, but I respect the hustle. Quite. And who knows, at some point if I ever get the chance, maybe I'll put it on the movie night list and force everybody to watch it and trick people into thinking I'm talking about Bullet Train. (laughs) As intended. As intended. So, let's move on since barely anything to say about Bullet Train Down. Mm-hmm. Let's go to another one that's not releasing theatrically, but I didn't realize until tonight. Samaritan. Mm-hmm. This is definitely the most interesting Sylvester Stallone thing in a while. This feels like steel, somehow. This feels mm-hmm. like old man steel. <laughs> except it's not Shaq. Yeah. It's Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, it's kind of, I'm interested in it because it is another thing of here Sylvester Stallone being, like, horrendously overpowered, but it's at least, like, 
kind of grounded in reality a little bit. Like, it's not like, you know, like, it's not like over the top badassery like the fucking Expendables is. But it is kind of one of those things where it's like this. It kind of reminds me of the reasons why I like The Punisher, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm There's curious about it. There's a lot of subtext it. here. There's a lot yeah. of subtext in the presentation of Stallone as a hardened old badass who is getting on in years and is not mm-hmm. what he once was, but still better not fuck with him. Gee, subtle. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I. I'm it's the hammer. It. <laughs> That's why it feels like steel. It's the fucking hammer. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in it. I'm definitely not interested enough to sign up for Amazon Prime. Like, like I'm sorry, Amazon, but well, I, I I've already mean... got it. So yeah, I mean, I have an easy again, way to force everybody else to watch it. That is fair. Like my whole thing, and I know I talked about this before, is that I don't use Amazon enough in a general sense to watch to use Amazon Prime. So yeah, sorry, sorry, Jeff Bezos, Bezos, what have you? And rounding out trailers, we have got Pearl. What the, the fuck? <laughs> yeah, this like is the... that pre. This is the prequel to that movie X that I saw and told you guys about a couple oh, months really? ago. Yeah, yeah. No, my my like that. What the fuck? Nothing bad just happened just now, though. That was my reaction watching this trailer. Was just what the actual fuck is going on? <laughs> There's a lot of parallels because she's actually played by the same actress who played the main girl in X. Mm-hmm. But she's the old lady killer from X in this movie. And this is her uh, story. And there's a lot of parallels between the two in terms of wanting to be a star. Yeah. But I am deeply unsettled by this. This is actually... I When I heard they were making a prequel, it's like, okay, X was cool, but like, what are you going to do with this? And apparently what they're going to do is terrifying farmhouse mm. family murder. I mean, to kind of give you an insight of what my thought process was during this movie, this trailer, the first 30 seconds, I'm like, okay, why is A24 doing a biopic on Janis Joplin? <laughs> and then... And then, <laughs> and then it goes into the whole, like, um, murdering the duck thing. I'm like, okay, never mind. And then we see the still of someone actually blowing the fuck up in bloody guts. I'm like, I ne- never, never mind. Uh, <laughs> like how how this trailer is not a red band trailer. I do not understand. <laughs> uh, at some point, I'm gonna have to show you X. At at some point, yes. This X is a very good movie, and I'm looking forward to the prequel follow up. <laughs> Even if I, I'm still a little confused as to what they're going to do with it from here, but I guess we'll find mm. out. <laughs> so with that covering trailer time, mm-hmm. let's move to this weekend's box office. Oh boy. Top of the box office this weekend, DC League of Super Pets, which took $23 million domestically for a $41.3 million worldwide total against a $90 million budget, apparently. So okay. we'll Literally. see how much money this makes. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Second place, Nope, with eighteen point <laughs> five million domestic for an eighty point six million domestic slash worldwide total. Apparently, it hasn't released in other territories. Not sure mm. if it will, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. It does have a sixty eight million dollar budget, so hopefully, it starts to it keeps that up and it starts to make some money. I'm not sure what the production budget was. Typically, it's usually about. The same. Usually, you have to double the bu- the budget for it to start making money. But I feel like with smaller movies, there's some wiggle room there because the production budget's probably or the marketing budget's probably not as big. Yeah. But we'll see. Third place, Love and Thunder, with a thirteen point one million dollar domestic weekend for three hundred and one point six million domestic and six hundred sixty three point six million worldwide. Fourth place, we got. Minions with a 10.9 million domestic weekend for a 320.4 million dollar domestic total and 712.1 million dollars worldwide. And in fifth place, your favorite movie that you wish would stop making money, it's Top Gun Maverick! I want to buy the Blu-ray, for God's <laughs> sake! Good luck! 
It's like, let me, god damn it, Paramount, just let me buy the Blu-ray already. <laughs> it made 8.4 million domestic this weekend for a 650.3 million domestic total and 1.32 billion dollars worldwide. How is this movie still making eight million dollars a week? <laughs> yeah, nutty, right? No, that's a what weekend. The hell? That's a weekend. That's like oh my three God. nights. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's gotten to the point now where I am seriously considering just like getting a ticket for like the AMC in downtown St. Petersburg and just going to see it again because it's like, all right, why well, are they going to deny me like me having this in my physical collection? So screw it. I'll just add to this problem. <laughs> Here, you know what I'm going to do? Because you're my friend, I'm going to look up and see if there's a Blu-ray release date yet. Oh, for God's sake, please, yes. <laughs> I'm sure they have to have a date planned. They, ha I'm pretty sure, I wouldn't be shocked if it's one of those things where it's like, alright guys, theatrical release, like, no, no, people are still shelling out money for this. Shut the fuck up. There's not going to be a Blu-ray release as long as we're still in the top five every weekend. <laughs> and to okay, be honest, so if that... There isn't an official one. I'm seeing differing estimates of either this month or next month. Please, for the love of Christ. Especially if there's a steelbook. Mm. Um, but it's like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the higher ups of Paramount I was like, okay, so we're going to do the fiscal release. I was like, fuck no, man. Like, we're still making shit tons of money. We're not t turning off this gravy train. <laughs> <laughs> True. Mm. So, and I don't blame them. <laughs> funny story about this weekend. Mm -hmm. I was going to go see Vengeance, and then it turns out I couldn't make it work with my schedule, because mm -hmm. the only releases were either before I got off work, or at like 10pm, and unfortunately, that was not going to work out. Right. Same thing happened with DC League of Super Pets, so I wasn't able to see that either, not that I would have wanted to. So I, I think... I figured the concern with that would just be more so you walking into the theater with a with a notebook with with a bunch of kids around. I mean that would be a little funny, but <laughs> I mean I could just go at ten p.m. and there would presumably be no kids there. And I mean, going at ten p.m. for a dumb kids movie feels better than going at ten p.m. for a movie that's presumably longer. Actually, I never compared run times. Anyway, point is, <laughs> unfortunately, no movie review this week. So mm. we're bringing back discussion topics. Yay, discussions! Temporarily. Temporarily. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Mm. Next week is definitely Bullet Train, and that's happening come hell or high water. Oh yes, absolutely. But, our discussion for this week is movies that you were pleasantly surprised by. Yes. Um, and we each do, have three. Yeah, do, do you want to start off, or do, should I? Yeah, I'll start with... I'll start with one, and if you've watched any of my previous MMA Monthly Movie Award videos back when they were still up, two of these are familiar, and I'm sorry, <laughs> but mm. I'm going off of what I can remember, and my memory is shit. Yeah, so, same. Dream Horse. <laughs> okay, so I never saw that movie, but I remember you and Nick telling me that it was so much better than you thought it was going to be. It was, especially for being just felt kind of saccharine, honestly. Mm. Like, very, very feel-goody, with nary an actual conflict that springs to mind. Like, there was nothing huge. It was basically just a feel-good story about this little racehorse that could. <laughs> but, boy, I was I was not expecting the kind of genuine emotion that I got out of watching this horse win races. Was there, um, because I don't care about spoilers at this point with how long ago that movie was, was there anything, like, particular that still, like, sticks out to you in regards to it when you guys saw it? Honestly, the main thing that sticks out is the ending, which mm -hmm. was the actors and the actual people that they were playing, because this is based on it's one of those based on a true story things. Oh, okay. So you had the actors and the actual people who the actors were playing standing with each other all singing a song. Oh, that's that sounds very wholesome. And I remember looking up the song, and now I forget what it was. <laughs> Not important, because I can't find it. So, mm. yeah, I remember expecting this movie to be just 
utterly stupid, and I remember just seeing it because I needed to cover it for the MMAs and because I needed to see something that weekend. Mm-hmm. But, wow. <laughs> I walked out of it actually having a good time and not even because I was making fun of it the whole time. Yeah, no, no, I, I remember, I think I remember you actually saying, like, I was expecting to make fun of this movie, but I just, like, couldn't, or something along those lines. It was too sincere somehow. <laughs> That's a rarity, especially when it comes to you and movies. <laughs> right? I usually respond to emotional sincerity the same way I respond to any other kind of emotional vulnerability, aggressively and with deep, cynical disdain. Mm. <laughs> but here it worked! Here it worked very well, from what I understand. Yeah. All right, now you say one. Okay, so one definitely, and this movie is one of those ones where I love it, but I don't quite love it enough to try and hunt down a steelbook for it, is Nicolas Cage's Pig. I need to get that on disc. Oh, yeah. No, this was... I remember when we were talking about going to see it, it's like, yeah, Nicolas Cage like is a hermit in a forest and he has a pet pig, and it's like, this sounds dumb as hell but let's go watch it. And holy crap, was it anything but. Like, you know, kind of figure it's going to be one of those things where it's just Nick Cage with a pig and just Nick caging it up. But it's compelling. It is um, it is really hilarious in a lot of places in ways that you don't expect. Um, And it's just... It, it, uh, hey man, it, that's it's my really... bike. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things like that. And it also helped that when we went to see it, we were the only two people in the theater. Which is a total fucking shock thinking about it. Yeah. It's like, how is this movie... How did we get in... Because it wasn't even like we saw a late showing. It was like a, a, a late afternoon showing. So like prime time for a movie. And it was empty. I'm like... This movie does not deserve an empty theater, but it's a good thing it is, because holy crap, are we being assholes right now? We were! <laughs> it was great! It's like, uh, what's wrong with that truck? Everything! <laughs> I would have put Pig on my list if you hadn't put it on yours, probably. Oh, yes. Because, honestly, I was expecting John Wick, but with Nicolas Cage. <laughs> and, not that that sounds bad... But yeah. it's a case of, I've seen John Wick, I don't need mm -hmm. to see John Wick again. But, but a pig instead of a pit bull. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, that worked out. Definitely pig. It was surprisingly heartfelt and kind of... I don't want to say ponderous, because I feel like ponderous is supposed to be a negative term, but it was very... You kind of feel the weight of stuff. Yeah. In it. Like, mm -hmm. you feel this is a guy who's been through some shit, but he's had a life. Yeah. Yeah, especially Which going was, back. It worked out very well. Yeah, no, it, it worked very well. Especially with, you know, it being the whole thing of, like, you know, you kind of feel bad for Nick Cage's character at the point, because it is a thing of, like, when you when the movie goes further and establishes like, who he is and why he's important in the general, like, universe of the movie, it really is a thing of, like, you kind of feel for him, because this is a dude who, like, for all intents and purposes, just wants to live in the forest in peace with his pig, and as stupid as that sounds in the context of the movie, it is completely understandable, and you do feel for him when that gets, like, more or less taken away from him. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to say my next one, which mm -hmm. is Sonic the Hedgehog. <sighs> to be fair, I think that's a pleasant surprise for everyone, considering, like, how it was originally released with the first trailer. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, because it wasn't just that the design was terrible in the first trailer, it was just none of it seemed, mm -hmm. none of it seemed like the jokes landed. Yeah. And yet, somehow... By tweaking the design, and apparently one of the worst jokes was just in the trailer, which was a honestly kind of a pleasant surprise from a lot of trailers where they'll put the best stuff in the trailer. This one is like, okay, they got the worst stuff out of the way and left out all the good stuff. That's that's actually neat. Right. I'm referring, of course, to the... Is your ch Do you have your child in that bag? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's a child, but it's not mine. <laughs> It's weirder if it's not your kid. Oh, that's all I can think about. Uh, KRS-1 intensifies. Whoop, but, whoop, that's the sound of the police. <laughs> no, I'm still honestly a little taken aback and offended at 
how good this <laughs> movie was. And it got a really good sequel. Which I still need to watch at some point. So that's a twofer. Yeah. You still haven't seen Sonic 2. I still have not seen Sonic 2. And I, and you know what? Of all the movies that it's been like way too long for me to see, it is one of the very few that I still kind of sort of actively avoid seeing spoilers for. Wow. Uh, well yeah, because it's one... Yeah, because it's one of those things where it's like, I know I've kind of missed my chance and it's not like a super high priority, but it's still one of those things where it's like, no, I do want to see this, especially after seeing how the first one went. And I don't want to be spoiled on stuff per se, um, because of I remember how much I enjoyed and how surprised I was with how much I enjoyed the first one. Yeah, I was very taken aback at how this managed to take so many things that in other movies are absolute cliches and actually basically play them straight but have it work based solely on how well Ben Schwartz and James Marsden play off each other. Yeah. And even then they had some other pleasant subversions like for once Mm. the intervention of an alien creature or some cosmic misunderstanding does not create relationship drama. That was nice. That was very nice. The fact that Tom and Maddie are just both perfectly communicative and fine with each other throughout the whole thing, and she just rolls with it, is great. Yeah, that's, that, oh god, that's just something, honestly, that's just something that's not shown in movies enough. No, and especially not these kind of movies. This is the kind of movie where, like, in lesser hands, there absolutely would have been a part where she finds out and reads in the riot act over endangering their lives or whatever, and... (laughs) Turns yeah. into a whole thing. Mm. But thank God. And I honestly originally had not expected much from Jim Carrey either. Oh, Like, no, I figured Jim it was Carrey. just going to be Jim Carrey, Jim carrying it up, and it was, but somehow, he pulls it. No, Jim Carrey, like, just killed it as the villain, 100%, while still very much Jim carrying it up. I personally remember enjoying it. And to be honest, this is something that I still can't tell if this was, like, actually done on purpose, or it was just kind of, like my reaction to all of it, but all of the very aggressive product placement and how it turned from being annoying to actually hilarious at certain points. (laughs) I, the Olive Garden stuff should not have worked. No, it should not be funny at all. (laughs) And I feel like it mostly only works because I was busy being confused why they didn't go with Sonic (laughs) Drive-Thru. That really is a missed opportunity. Because it's right fucking there! It is right there, yeah. It even has chili dogs! (laughs) And yet, the Olive Garden joke works way better than it has any right to. Yeah, and especially at the very end, where it's like, alright, we need to, we're here to give you compensation for everything you've got. It was like, okay, is it like a money to like rebuild our house or anything like that? It's like uh, a a free night at Olive Garden. This is, this is what you get for the U.S. government. For all the shit we just went through... Have you seen The Never-Ending fr- Postable? It's never-ending. <laughs> <laughs> I can't resonate with a lot of that, unfortunately, because I it's been so long since I've even stepped inside of an Olive Garden. But regardless, it's just You know, just one of those... I don't think I've ever been. No, I think I went once. Huh. And that was probably like a decade ago, if I had to guess. Like, if I want pasta, I'll just make pasta at home. Same. Like, if I want pasta, I'm just gonna go to the grocery store, get pasta and sauce, and go from there. Or, if I'm not making pasta at home, I'm getting pasta somewhere fancy. (laughs) I have not mastered the art of that just yet. Mostly just because I still prefer cooking overall. Yeah, that's fair. (laughs) So, let's hear your next one. So, my next one is going to be, even though I am very upset that it's still in theaters, Top Gun Maverick. (laughs) So, and mostly that's just because of the fact that the first Top Gun, while being relative, while being fairly enjoyable, is still kind of, like, it can't, I can't shake the thought, and especially because it actually happened, of the movie being, like, you know, Navy propaganda first, and then an actual movie second. Uh, and the thing is, is that I'm not even saying that based on, like, thought processes. The, the U.S. Navy actually straight up said, like, when Maverick came out their recruitment rate shot up by, like, 500%. Jesus Uh, Christ. Yeah, so, like, this is, like, this is, like, not even me pulling something out of my ass. Even though I did enjoy that movie, the thing with Maverick is that I kind of figured it would be the same thing, but 
and it, and to a certain extent it was, but it actually does more for the movie side of things. And honestly, the movie side of things is probably the best part, which is saying something because the fighter jet porn in this movie is second to none. <laughs> uh, like, like for real, like just everything with the fighter jets and all is just like, oh, this is great. But the actual movie bit is compelling. You have reasons to like feel these ways for these characters. You're kind of you're rooting for them in a certain sense. I you actually def- give a shit about Maverick, which is more than I, I can say about the first Top Gun. And not even just Maverick, but all the other characters, especially with some of the shit that they get into, like, especially during the last bit where, you know, and spoilers if you haven't watched one of our previous episodes, but this movie's been out for, like, what, three months at this point? So... Yeah, what are you waiting for, the Blu-ray? Good luck! (laughs) Fuck off. (laughs) Um, Even the whole bit where they're stuck in the stolen F-14s, which have been out of commission, and I was actually wrong about this when I mentioned it before. These are the, those planes have been out of commission with the Navy for the past like 10, 15 years, but still very, very, very obsolete by fighter jet standards. And they're having to face state of the art SU 57 stealth fighters. And even though that was awesome, it was a thing during the whole time of they are so going to die. <laughs> like, there is no reason for them to survive all of this. Yeah. Uh, like, just all of it was. Like, I figured I was going to go and come out of it liking it, because, again, I'm sucker for military movies. Right. But I was genuinely blown away by how good it was at just being a movie. For me, it's like what Ford versus Ferrari is to car movies. Maverick is to fighter jet movies. I still would rank Ford versus Ferrari above that. But it's kind of the same gist of that, even though it's focusing on this one thing, there is enough here for it to stand to a general audience on a movie front. And I was very happy with that. Hmm. So, yeah, Maverick, Agreed. definitely. <laughs> so for my last one, I'm actually doing a bit of a throwback. And by a bit, I mean a while ago. And I'm going to put Guardians of the Galaxy. Because, for some context, Avengers was the movie that got me to pay attention to movies. In the sense of... Mm-hmm. It was the first movie where I really felt like I had seen a really, really good movie. Because before then it was just, oh yeah, that was alright. Or, eh, I didn't much care for it, but I couldn't pin down... I wasn't interested in pinning down lies. Right. Avengers was the thing that got me super interested in movies. But Guardians of the Galaxy is where it finally clicked for me that Marvel in particular, Marvel Studios, was really good at making these kind of movies. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't necessarily think it was going to be terrible, because the trailer still looked pretty decent. But I didn't have especially high hopes, because it was a bunch of characters nobody gave a shit about, and there's a raccoon, and a tree only says his name, and (laughs) that juvenile uh, look, Chris Pratt's flicking off the camera. (laughs) Ha ha ha, isn't this funny? But (laughs) it was surprisingly heartfelt in a way that I don't think many people were really expecting. I I do very much remember when the news of the movie first came out and you were telling me about it because at this point my like I already have a limited knowledge of Marvel stuff, but believe me, it was much worse way back in the day. I remember like kind of the reaction when you heard about that was why Guardians of the Galaxy? Who gives a shit about the Guardians of the Galaxy? Like Yeah. It's just something completely out of left field, and it wasn't until much later that I understood how much of an asshole Guardians was, as far as, like, all the potential, of all the characters that could be picked out of Marvel stories to pick those guys. But boy, howdy, did they do a good job of just, like, presenting them, and, like, just making you care, and just making it just overall very enjoyable. Yeah, Um, the one-two punch of Guardians followed by Ant-Man the next year were the movies yeah. that got me to generally stop caring about who the subject of any of these comic book movies are. There's still exceptions, mostly Sony ones. <laughs> although also some DC ones. Mm-hmm. But, to be fair, that's because they haven't really... They can't even make Superman, and they can't even make... Really, they can barely make Venom work. Mm. So, what does that say? But, <laughs> point is, Guardians was... A lot funnier than I was expecting, a lot Mm -hmm. cooler than I was expecting, and honestly a lot more sincere than I was expecting. And it just kind of 
clicked in a way that I didn't expect, and then it went on, kind of like with Sonic, it went on to have a really great sequel, and Guardians Volume 2 is probably one of my favorite Marvel movies. Not because it's perfect, but just because the parts that are mm. good are really, really good. Really good, yeah. I think for me, kind of a thing about Guardians 1, and I didn't think about this until like kind of just now, in all honesty, anyone who's like, you know, like talk to me, relatively speaking, or anything like that in regards to like movies, games, stuff like that. I'm not as big in the movies as you are, Cody, but something that will draw me to any media is music choice. At this point, when Guardians came out, I had already like cared about music in in movies and games and how much it influences things. But Guardians was very much one of the movies that like really stuck in the whole thing of like, yeah, a good soundtrack, especially a good like soundtrack you've never even like heard of will really make or break anything because i was very blown away because very much like at the time those were the music that was played were genres i'm not familiar with but it just works so well and it's so much makes the experience so much more enjoyable i think my favorite is still the whole like them playing cherry bomb with the slow motion walking scene and it's just like yeah yeah, this is this is this is something to care about. Funny enough, so. that's my least favorite song on that soundtrack, and it's still a banger, and it's still used great in the movie. Oh, I thought it was Pina Colada. Oh no, I love the Pina Colada song. The Pina <laughs> Colada song is hilarious just for how <laughs> utterly fucking deranged it is. But, <laughs> like, I only knew probably about half the songs on the soundtrack before it came out. And even then, I wasn't super familiar. Like, I knew Hooked on a Feeling because I'd seen Reservoir oh, yeah. Dogs, I think, at that point. Well, I think everyone knows that song as well, so... Yeah, you'd be surprised. I knew the Pina Colada song mm. because Shrek. <laughs> I forgot that was in Shrek. I was familiar with Ooh Child and Ain't No Mountain High Enough, but not mm -hmm. in a... In a, I'm familiar with these songs, but I probably don't know their names. Yeah. I knew I Want You Back because, I mean, Jackson 5, and it's a popular song. And I think I was already familiar with Come and Get Your Love, but I'm, that was probably from a commercial or something. Hmm. And then the rest of the songs, I had no idea. I'd never heard, like, Moon Age Daydream, Go All the Way, I'm Not in Love. Yeah. But now... Now I can name any of them, <laughs> because the, the soundtrack was good enough where I actually, yeah, I, I have the soundtrack. I have Awesome Mix Volume 1 on CD, for crying out loud. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, I have to double check, but I think I actually got that on a vinyl as a present. I got a, I got one of the Marvel like soundtracks as a vinyl, and I think that one was it. I don't know. Um, but... Even still, like, agreed with all of that. Also, I because I can't remember, because honestly, this scene could fit in either of them. Was it Guardians 1 or Guardians 2 that had the Zune scene? That was 2. That was 2? Ah. Uh, yeah, 2's, the Zune has, vol has volume 3 on it. Presumably. Oh, does it? Oh, right, right, right. Okay, cool, cool. Because yeah, Walkman got smashed. Yeah. I mean, granted, that whole bit could have fit in either of the movies. <laughs> yeah, Guardians 1 was... I think more so for you, but even for me, definitely a pleasant time. It was good for me because, like I said, I had no idea what to what to expect going in, and I left kind of like, well, I didn't know what to expect, but it definitely wasn't that, and I'm very happy with what I got. One hundred percent. So, what's your last pick? For me, my last pick is Bad Boys for Life, and honestly, it's kind of one of those ones where I really can't pin down any particular reason why it was like. So a good time, because it's one of those things where it's, for me, it is a good, a very good and very enjoyable turn your brain off movie. I had seen like the previous couple bad boys. And for me, those movies are kind of thinking like, ah, these are kind of nutty, but not really like up my particular alley. Right. I, en I enjoyed bad boys for life just because it felt a bit more, relatively speaking for these movies, a bit more mature. And in that sense, they were able to use that to create some very hilarious moments <laughs> because it is a thing of like yeah both of these detectives are like getting up in their years and one of them's like no man i have a family and even like when will smith is trying to um, drag his guy along he's like still being a dad in like the most like ridiculous moments possible <laughs> 
Yeah, Bad Boys for Life for me was definitely a very pleasant surprise because I wasn't expecting it to be bad by any means. Well, okay, I wasn't expecting it to be like noteworthy, but it was definitely a lot better than I had anticipated. So that's definitely my my pick for that. I sat through it, which is more than I could say for the first Bad Boys. So mm. I'll agree. I don't remember <laughs> much of it. I just remember. I feel like most of what I remember was already in the trailers anyway. But yeah. But it was still not as bad as I was expecting, and it was one of the better movies of that month, which, yeah. not saying much. Yeah, I think la- I think last time we discussed Bad Boys for Life, I was under the impression that I'd given it best movie of January 2020. I forgot 1917 came out that same month. That's what oh, won. Yeah. Bad Boys for oh, Life yeah. got the most pleasant surprise award, though. Hence mm-hmm. its inclusion here, I suppose. Honestly, it was kind of a tie between that and 1917 for me as to what my last pick would be, but it was kind of one of those things where looking at 1917, it's like, okay, how can you look at this and not expect a good movie? So Yeah, that was a good time waiting to happen. Well, I shouldn't say good time, but a, a very In terms good of quality. movie waiting to happen. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, Bad Boys for Life definitely would be like my final slot in that pick. Cool, cool. So this actually went a bit longer than I was expecting it to. Well done, us, I suppose. Well done, us! Woo! (laughs) (laughs) You just got me copied. I just died. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, follow us on Spotify or RSS, and yeah, let us know if you want more discussion topics, and if so, we'll Try to squeeze them in where we can, I suppose. Next week, definitely Bullet Train. Oh yes, Bullet Train is going to be is going to be a good time. I've got half the weekend off anyway, so nothing's going to stop me. Hell yeah! <laughs> Much like a bullet train. <laughs> Damn, uh, I'm ha- good. You were very happy with that segue, weren't you? I'm so pleased with myself. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to go finish dying. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.